Hi everybody, Ryan Schumacher back again. We had another question, which is uh, a stumper for me this morning, and that was on uh, Psalm 82 and John chapter 10. So we were talking about the divine council and talking specifically about Psalm 82. And the point that I was making was um, that an understanding of the divine council theology allows us to read passages that don't make much sense and get what they're talking about. So the example I brought up was how in John chapter 10, and I'm going to read the scriptures, uh, Jesus quotes Psalm 82. And if we follow to Psalm 82, we read it. And if we have this idea that there's no way at all that the Jews could believe in other divine beings, we have no idea what to make sense of this. And there was a then a question that came up, which was, well, in John chapter 10, doesn't it say that you know, isn't Jesus sort of uh, trying to say that he's uniquely God as opposed to just one of a whole bunch of gods? Um, and so, like, is it really being used in that way? Did Jesus really believe in this divine counsel or or not? Uh, that's sort of the spirit of the question, at least as I remember it. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then I attempted to answer, then I... Uh, <laughs> forgot the conclusion of my paper. And so I said I would get back to it. So this is something that could maybe be its own Bible Geeks class. Um, I'm going to try and do this relatively quickly. So feel free to send me follow-ups on this if you'd like. Uh, but let's go over the two passages. And then I want to share with you the traditional interpretation of the passage. And then another interpretation that I think as I've spent more time on this, I actually wrote two papers on this in graduate school, and I think I repudiate both of them at this point. Uh, there's maybe a third way that I'm feeling compelled by, uh, but I can at least share with you some of the ideas. But this is one of the trickiest conundrums I've come across in scripture. So let's start here. Uh, we're going to start in John chapter 10. We're going to read out of the NRSV. So the uh, we'll start here, verse 22. So at the time of the festival, the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I've told you, you don't believe. The works that I do in my father's name testify to me. But if you do not believe, you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. We know this passage. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Okay, two things I want to emphasize here. Uh, I've told you and you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. So he's not asking them uh, just to believe his words, but his, say his works prove it. And then this one here, the Father and I are one. Okay, what happens as soon as that's said? Verse 31, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus replied, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? So he's going back to his works again. And they say, it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy because you, the only human being, are making yourself God. Okay, so this is the statement that gets him in trouble. I and the Father are one. That's when they pick up stones and he's like, wait, what I do? And they said, it's because you said you're making yourself God. It was in specific reaction to this. So this is the violating statement. The father and I are one. Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If to those whom the word of God came were called gods and the scripture cannot be annulled, can you say that the one whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I said, I am God's son. Okay. So the, Here's what happens. I and the Father are one. Stones. Why? You're making yourself God. Jesus answers, is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? Okay. So this is where, and then if those to whom the word of God came were called God's, um, can you say that I'm blaspheming if I say I'm God's son? All right. So what are the questions here? I guess he finishes up. If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. Again, we're doubling down on the works. But if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works so that you may understand that the Father is in me and I am in him. All right. So doubling down, Father and I are one. I am in me, the Father, and uh, I am in him. The Father is in me. But in the middle, he's got this thing. So you're making yourself God. And then Jesus says, is it not written? I said you are gods. And if others can be called gods, then why am I 
uh, blaspheme me if I say I'm God's son. So the question here is who or what is Jesus doing? It kind of seems like Jesus is saying something to the extent of, hey, aren't there other gods? I'm just another God. Uh, why are you mad at me? Which doesn't make much sense, right? We're supposed to be talking to Jewish monotheists. Uh, so one of the things we can do, we can say, okay, is it not written in your law? One of the first things as an interpreter you should do, if there's going to be a quote from the Old Testament, go read the context of it. Uh, oh. All right, so what's the context here? Psalm 82. So we're going to read Psalm 82, then we're going to get into this a bit. Um, so Psalm 82, a plea of justice, Psalm of Asaph. So God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And this is what I was saying in the class. If you follow the reference here, you're just like, uh, if you don't have an understanding of ancient Near Eastern divine council theology, this doesn't make sense. But we're Bible geeks. We're working through this. So in the midst of the gods, in this divine council, in the pantheon, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They, now we're talking about the gods, have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Here's the quote. I say you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. And then it ends with this exhortation. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. So Jesus is bringing in, is it not written, I said, you are gods? Okay, that's down here. So who is that spoken to? Yahweh is speaking to the divine council, the gods. I say, so you are gods, children of the most high. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince, because they are not doing what they are supposed to. They're not carrying out the will of Yahweh the way that it is supposed to be carried out. There is no repudiation of their divinity. Uh, it is just that, you know, I say you are God's children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. So how is that a defense here? Father and I are one. Well, we're picking up stones to stone you. Why? Because you called yourself God. Hey, your law says I said you are gods. So who are these gods? How is that supposed to help? If he's being charged with breaching Jewish monotheism, then it sure seems like a weird defense to say, hey, no, aren't there a bunch of other gods? Uh, but at the same time, we know about this divine council theology. So what might Jesus be saying? So I'm going to give you a couple ideas here. Uh, first, I'm going to pull up my uh, Quick, so this was one of the papers I wrote in graduate school about this. I'm actually going to drag this over here. Uh, so in here, I did a, and I'm not going to read you through the whole paper, but I was writing a paper on John chapter 10, and I had to get into Psalm 82. And the quick summary here is, after reading many commentaries, there were three ideas that came through. There are lesser divine beings, angels, or an ancient Near Eastern pantheon. That's your divine council. Uh, or, in the interpretive tradition, we have humans, Israel's judges or uh, the Israelites at Sinai. So the lesser divine beings, the divine council being one of them, uh, that is one of the uh, things that we've talked about, that that could, be, uh, that could be who the gods are. Here I want to just very quickly say, another interpretation that's offered is uh, that of Israel's judges. So the judges can claim the title gods because they've been given the authority to judge, which belongs to God alone. Uh, so the expression gods is then applied to them to the extent that they possess this high office for which they're divinely commissioned. Um, but they don't live up to the calling. So there is an interpretive tradition that says this psalm is a recollection of Yahweh pronouncing judgment upon the failed Israelite judges. Uh, this would be a way of saying that the word gods is actually referring to humans. So then what Jesus is doing there is saying, hey, the title of God has applied to humans in the past. Um, so why is that Why is that blasphemy? The other one is the Israelites at Sinai. So is this, uh, is this phrase talking about the Israelites at Sinai? And here we're leaning on Jewish Midrash tradition. 
So one quote right here from the Jewish interpretive uh, tradition, the Midrash. Um, you stood at Mount Sinai and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and obey. Whereupon I said, you are gods. But when you said to the calf, this is the, your God, all Israel, I said to you, nevertheless, you shall die like men. So here there's a quote uh, from one of the commentators. This, the rabbis imagined God is uttering the Psalms to Israel on Sinai. In it, the God tells them that through receiving the law, they become gods, but they will lose their status by their sin and so inherit death. So those are your three different options. Uh, the, so the question is, how is Jesus using this? Jesus could be saying, uh, and this would be probably the um, typical interpretation, Jesus saying, hey, the title God being applied to a human being is actually not special. You can't stone me for that. And I was sent by God just like the Israelites were specially sent by God or the Israeli judges were divinely commissioned by God and your scripture calls them gods. So I can't be in any more trouble than they are. That's sort of the, the traditional way that this is understood. Um, and I wrote in defense of that proposition in my paper here. That's why I'm not going to show you the rest of it. Um, mainly on the idea that this, uh, it didn't make sense to me that Jesus would be defending himself from a charge of breaching Jewish monotheism by invoking the idea of other gods. It just seemed like that would get Jesus into hotter water. And so this idea that um, human beings were referred to as gods would uh, was, you know, more tenable to me. I'll tell you, the more I thought about it, though, even after and, you know, even in grad school, I kind of gave up on this uh, because I wrote a paper then on Psalm 82 in my uh, third Old Testament class. And it just became really darn clear that this was the ancient Near Eastern pantheon. Uh, but, you know, more so when you look here at Jesus context. So the father and I are one. He's making a statement of oneness with the father. He's making a bigger claim. In, it's almost as if that Israelites at Sinai argument proves too much. Okay, they're called gods, Elohim. Let's say that's the argument. They're called gods. But they were never Yahweh. They were never one with Yahweh. There was a categorical distinction between the Israelites at Sinai or Israel's judges and Yahweh. Jesus' claim is I and Yahweh are one. It's no defense to say, you know, I and Yahweh are one. We're about to stone you because you say that. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just one of the like other lesser ones. But if you don't believe that, then believe my works because I and Yahweh are one. That doesn't, that really doesn't carry much water. It's logically just as problematic as when I was like, well, it's logically problematic that Jesus defends himself from a charge of polytheism uh, by claiming the existence of other gods. So what do we do with this? Well, I'm going to show you a resource here uh, from the Lexham Bible Dictionary. Lexham Bible Dictionary is a very uh, kind of obscure resource. It's available only through Logos Bible software. Um, but the reason I'm going to do it is because the editor of the, uh, I think his name will be in here, um, should be one of them, uh, the academic editor, here we go, uh, academic editor of Logos Bible software, um, Michael Heiser, who's the one who uh, wrote this passage, is probably the authority in at least the English-speaking world on the divine council um, theology in the Old Testament. And he's written something for the Lexham Bible Dictionary specifically on this. And I read through it. I'll, I'll say I haven't really sat down and thought through this as much as the other interpretations, but I think there's a lot to commend to his reading of this in that it gets us out of a lot of the problems that I just described. So there's this whole article here on the Divine Council um, that Dr. Heiser wrote. And you can actually find much, if you look up Michael Heiser, John 10, he has a whole podcast on this. Um, he just speaks of this quite often, Psalm 82, John 10. Um, and I think on this, he does terrific work. Um, so here in this article, he goes over the interpretation that we just talked about. So 
you know, Jesus asserts that he and the Father are one. The Jews thought this was blasphemy. In defense of his claim, he was one with God. Jesus quotes the psalm. Following the quotation, he says, the Father is in him and he is in the Father. So the usual interpretation of this passage, that the Elohim were human, that's what we talked about, it's either the judges or the Israelites at Sinai, is based on two assumptions. Judeo-Christian mon uh, monotheism could not have had other Elohim. And to whom the word of God came refers to the Jews who received the law at Sinai. Dr. Heiser says, however, both these assumptions are wrong. Uh, I also, just a side note, I love how plain spoken Dr. Heiser is. He's a little, uh, he can sound a little grumpy sometimes, but it's never unclear where he stands. I, I really do appreciate his level of directness. Um, even if I don't always agree with him, whether or not my uh, agreement or disagreement with him takes carries much water is for someone else to decide. Um, okay. So he is putting down a different interpretation here. Here's one of the things he says. So, okay, it's already clear that there were other uses of Elohim. The word of God was not the law. Those who received it were not human. Psalm 82, 6-7 says, I said, you are gods, sons of the most high. All of you, nevertheless, like humans, you will die and fall like any prince. The speaker I in the passage is the God of Israel. And so that's what we talked about here. So I say you are gods. So who's the I? Uh, you know, this, oh goodness. Uh, here, you know, this is, uh, you know, God taking his place in the divine council, and then he begins speaking. So who's the I? Yahweh. God was standing in the council among the lesser Elohim. God announces that the Elohim of the council are his sons. So you are children of the most high. This one right here, uh, if we look at the... Uh, the word, oh, yeah, if we look at the word study here, bene, son. So NRSV has more inclusive language, uh, generally speaking, but this is the word son. So uh, God announces the Elohim are his sons, but because of their corruption, they're going to lose their immortality. The word of God in the original context is the specific utterance of Yahweh. This is Heiser's claim. So here, if the ones to whom the word of God came were called gods. So he's saying, rather than the word of God being the law, the word of God is right here. You are sons of God. You are, they are the recipients of God's word in Psalm 82. I find this uh, reasonable. Um, you know, word of God can mean a lot of things, but at least it does confine it to the context of the quote. The ones to whom the word of God came were called gods. Well, who's called gods? These lesser gods. What is the word of God? Well, the word of God's in here. All right, I can follow that. It's logical. So he said, is the specific utterance of Yahweh to his council members. They in turn are recipients of that word. The recipients are not Israelites or any other group of Jews. So Jesus refers to the original utterance spoken by God when we quoted the psalm, not the Jewish nation receiving revelation. Jesus is defending his statement, here we go, to be one with the Father by reminding his hearers that their Old Testament teaches there were other divine sons of God who are Elohim. So here's the differences in the views. So he says that, um, in his opinion, Jesus is in fact stating that these other gods are divine. The word of God came to them. The Jews are not um, Elohim. Jesus reminds them that their scriptures say that there are other divine sons of God. Okay, so how does this then conclude? John 10, 36, 38, Jesus asserts that his high status as the son is based on him doing the works of his father. The father is in him. The phrase parallels Exodus, where the name Yahweh's presence was in the angel of Yahweh. So in 1036, Jesus claims that the presence is in him. He's claiming to be the second power, second Yahweh, which should mean, in turn mean that he was Lord of the divine council with the invisible Yahweh. Thus, Jesus' claim of oneness with the father is developed by the quotation and by what follows. The result is a powerful claim to deity and consistent with the rest of the Gospel of John. I'm going to try and unpack this, at least the way that I understand it. What this would mean is he says the Father and I are one, right here. He concludes the Father and I are one. He's not going to say pull some sort of magician sleight of hand and change the uh, context there. So they say you're making yourself God. How does he respond? So is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. Okay. If those to whom the word of God came were called God, so if the lesser divine beings are called God, can you say to me, whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, 
that I'm blaspheming because I say I'm God's son? If I'm not doing the works of the Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, then even though you don't believe me, believe the works. Here's how I read this in the light of what Dr. Heiser saying. He says, I and the Father are one. They say, we're going to stone you because you're making yourself equal to God. He says, okay, isn't it written that those lesser beings who didn't even do God's will were called gods? And if they can be called gods, then how is it that I, who am doing the works of the Father, I, the obedient one, I am not the one who is showing unjust and injustice to the wicked. I am not the one who's ignoring the orphan. I am not the one who's failing to rescue the weak and, need, uh, weak and needy. I have knowledge and understanding because I am doing the things of the Father. If these people can be called gods, then how come I, as the one faithfully carrying out the works of the Father, can't be called God's son? So if I'm not doing the works of the Father, then don't believe me. But if I am, then believe the works so that you will know that I and the Father are one. So what he's actually saying here, at least this is the way that I understand where Dr. Heiser's going, is if you can call disobedient people who are uh, the, the disobedient divine beings uh, gods, how much more do you have to call me the one faithfully doing the works of the Father, uh, what I claim, which is that I am the Father are one. So... I think that right now, I've changed my opinion on this passage a bunch of times, but right now this is the uh, interpretation that seems to make the most sense to me as to how Jesus is using this in John 10. Uh, I would love some feedback on it. Happy to continue engaging one of this, the thornier problems. So anyway, if you stuck through this long, thanks for watching. Uh, I appreciate it. We'll see you next week.